Greetings. Welcome to my Let's Learn for Tales and Magiel. So, my name is Damien Fuxa, and I'm a Let's Player on YouTube. I've been doing uh, Tales and Magiel quite frequently for the past little while, and I've racked up a few wins in uh, normal difficulty mode. You can actually view my wins on the uh, character vault from the main site. And um, for the most part, I have a fairly good feel for how this game works. And I figured it was a good time to possibly part on a little bit of wisdom. Another reason for doing this Let's Play is because at the time of this recording, there really is only one other type of tutorial type of Let's Play for people trying to learn this game. And I feel that with roguelikes, they really are, are hard to get into, so it really does help to have uh, an, a reference to, from another player on how to actually play the game. So, the reasons for this Let's Play is, uh, Let's Learn is, is pretty much as follows. Pretty much just teach you the game, and... Uh, We'll have fun doing so, more or less, but watch me just play the game. So, I have um, I actually went on the forums for this game, and I actually sort of uh, cropped up some ideas on what type of uh, character I should possibly pick to sort of show you off. Um, I'll note that at the uh, start of this, um, when you open this game for the first time, a lot of the stuff that you can po possibly play, like the Yeek Race, the Undeads, um, most of the uh, classes, They'll all, they'll all be locked for you to um, have to unlock first before you can start playing them. As a result, you'll be limited in what you can play, but one of the character classes that you can't play immediately uh, would be to go with Elven Falor here and pick up the Shadow Blade. Now, I recommend that you play in normal difficulty. I'm actually not sure if you can um, play in Nightmare difficulty unless you actually win. And um, I also suggest you do it in Adventure mode. Um, these uh, difficulty settings modify how your uh, game's difficulty will be. Difficulty skills the monster's level so that they'll be harder or weaker. And permadeath basically regulates how many lives you have. On adventure mode, you'll have uh, multiple lives as you gain levels. And that's really good because this is a game that's uh, going to probably kill you quite a bit. And um, there's nothing you can really do about it. We're going to call this guy Davian Let's Learn. And we're just going to jump right in then. I'll note by the way, I've actually been trying to uh, create a few um, Let's Learn Let's Plays of this, but I haven't really had a good start with, you, uh, with any of them, so uh, hopefully this one will go a little bit better. Alright, so the first thing uh, that happens when you um, initially make your character, you get this level up screen that basically has all your talents and your stat points that you can spend at the uh, start of the game. I'm just going to initially close this, and uh, we'll just jump right into sort of a lore. So, something to note about this game is that there's a lot of lore in the game. Um, the uh, lore and elves that I picked are closest to nature, and our people have lived in thousands of years in the forest, really taking the parts in the, um, outside of the world. And um, when their home is threatened, the lore and elves can, can prove to be fearsome combatants. And we, love, we basically live peaceful lives in the forest, and we don't like being disturbed. Um, I'm a, a little bit of a restless sort, though, and I like to... Uh, now I've basically grown restless, I want is to step into the open world and explore around. Uh, we're basically going to adventure into uh, the lair of Norgos. He was once a steadfast ally of the Florin, but he started to grow corrupt. And uh, to the east of our capital, we also have uh, some other events happening. So, this is um, our character right here. You can move him around with the mouse, or you can use the arrow keys, or you can use the numpad keys. Um, if at any time you want to maybe, maybe rest or just wait a turn, you can press 5. And if you press R, you, can, you rest. If you press Z, you auto-explore. Um, before we do anything, I'm just going to jump into our talents and we'll spend a few. So initially with the Shadow Blade, you'll have um, 5 talent points spent, 2 in the generic and 2 class points. On the generic side, you'll have your racial spent in the Raft of the Woods here. And you'll have 1 point in Phase Door. These are fairly good um, starting points to sort of have your points invested in right away. So, we're pretty good with that. Over here on this side, um, for the most part, they, we'll be leaving it as is. We'll have a point here invested in Shadow Combat, and that's basically going to be our main damage, more or less, in the um, early part of the game. We also have a point in Lethality, which will um, basically let us convert the damage uh, that we do our knives with our Cunning stat in instead of Strength. And we'll also have an uh, Attack Talent here called Dual Strike. We're going to invest the remaining points, one into Rush, and then one into Dirty Fighting. And for now, we're going to invest a few uh, stat points into Dexterity. Um, I'll, tr I'll go into more detail about the talents and sta stats later on when I play through this Let's Through. But for now, we're just going to just leave those there. Uh, this uh, 
generic point that we have left over here, we're just going to invest it into heightened senses for now as well. All right, so this is our character, and down here is our hotbar. You'll note that um, you basically have your att attack talents and a few other icons here. The Shadow Blade, he starts off with this basically uh, ruin here called a Mana Surge Ruin. And you should probably also note that for the flooring race that they start with an Infusion Wild and Infusion Regeneration. These um, three things down here are basically your consumables. In other games you basically have like uh, healing potions or mana potions or other stuff like that. In this game you basically have infusions and ruins and they basically form something called inscriptions. Inscriptions are basically tactically useful items that more or less act like consumables, but they're reusable. So if I use this uh, regeneration room right here, it'll basically go on uh, cooldown for 9 turns and I'll get the effect for however long it is. Once that goes off cooldown, and as you can see we'll run it down, it will actually be available again and we can actually use that to heal ourselves again. So this actually adds a tactical layer to the game. Um, you can't basically, such as in Diablo 2, pot spam in this game. You will die if you even try uh, that sort of mechanism. Um, unless you're playing a character that actually bases itself off of uh, regeneration. Anyhow, first things first, most of this stuff is on cooldown. So what I want to do first, uh, first of all is just press the R key to rest it up. And what the R key will do, it will actually um, reset all our cooldowns on our skills to zero. And if we have any lost hit points, stamina, or mana, it will reset those as well. Alright, so first things first, um, I should also note by the way, if you, I have Shadow Combat here. This is actually a sustainability, so we can just hit it once and it'll be turned on, and it'll stay on, um, so long as it isn't turned off. Uh, it can be turned off by monsters or enemies and stuff like that. And um, we'll just do that for now. Also note that I'll, if you want, you can right-click it and you can say, I'll use when no enemies are visible. And if it does get turned off, it'll turn back on when no enemies are visible. I also have the phase door spell over here as well. Um, I'll note by the way if you press the page up or page down keys you can navigate your hotbar. Uh, there's basically five hot page keys um, that you can make use of. And it's worth knowing that if you have the bigger monitor you can basically display more of these uh, um, options down here on your hotkey for use. But I have a very limited monitor size so we can only display so much. Um, eventually in the game you'll have this is a sporadic array of stuff you can choose to do. Uh, as such I like to basically have my attack talents more or less on the left over here. Um, you, you mostly like to have like consumables like these, maybe over here a little bit, and then stuff like this, like tactically useful stuff like her uh, racial, we'll maybe put that a little in between them. Alright, so let's go find some monsters. So I can use the arrow keys to move around, and we looked, well, we just found our first monster here. So here's like an example of a monster. This is a green ooze. It doesn't have much hit points, but uh, this guy does have a special feature. He actually can split, and as you can see, he split in two. And as a result, there's now a second one. And it's split again. Now, multiplying enemies in this game, they're not usually too bad, but some of them can be. And they add a sort of element to the game. And you'll notice that more or less all the enemies have some sort, sort of unique feature to them. Uh, snakes, for example, they uh, move sporadically around, and they move uh, pretty fast. Sometimes they'll move out of the distance, but whatever. Now I move here. And now he's in range of us, and we can just... Bump attack him to kill him. I'll note by the way that much like in our roguelike, if you want to uh, bump attack, just basically move into the tile of the enemy, and you'll do damage to him. And you probably just notice here with the wolf is move two tiles. This is an example of like a feature that this guy has. Basically, wolves are fast moving enemies, so it's very possible that if I try and move away from them, they can catch up to me very easily. Snakes are also fast moving, but because they move sporadically, it's not as likely that they may uh, land right in type, um, right on top of my character real quick. Now, I'll note that this guy's taking a little bit of beating. This guy, you'll note that these guys all have different levels. Sometimes you'll fight guys that uh, are much higher level than you, and sometimes they'll just be more or less around your level. Um, so this guy's kind of injured me a little bit, so here's a good time to maybe use our regeneration uh, uh, infusion right here. That'll uh, take a turn to use, but we'll actually start regener regenerating over time, and then we can just continue to fight against this guy. I'll note as well that this white worm mass is also a multiplying enemy, but it multiplies before you uh, start attacking it. So that's its feature. Now, more or less all the stuff that I'm fighting here is really easy to fight. Um, in the starter dungeons you shouldn't have too much problems, but you should be careful. Sometimes you'll find your high level monsters, or ones that are just more tricky to fight. And there's an example of this guy multiplying. We also found item on the ground, much like in other roguelikes, you can 
fine items that you can make use of. We'll actually equip some of these stuff because uh, these will be useful for us to use. As you can see, we don't really have a whole lot of items available at the start. We actually only start with these daggers and this uh, rough layer armor and his light. Um, this actually contributes a little bit to uh, uh, what players call a really difficult start for the Shadow Blade. They um, basically start out very weak because their daggers don't do a whole lot of damage. And because they're dual wielding, this one, the offhand weapon here, will actually do 50% of the damage uh, capability of what it can do. I'll also note, by the way, that I tried to wear these uh, iron gauntlets here, but I can't actually wear them. This actually requires a talent to use. This, uh, as you can see, it requires, in the left there, talent armor training. Um, eventually, I might pick up armor training for, so I can use that, but until we do, we can't use it. And just to point up to where you can find out in your skills, and by the way, you can press P to bring up your skills at any time. Uh, armor training is right here, and if you invest one point in it, you can basically wield heavy meal armor, gauntlets, helms, and heavy boots much like the one I was trying to wear. Now, a lot, of, a lot of players will, you know, more or less eventually resort to doing this, but if you press the Z key, you'll basically all explore. What that does is it basically makes you move around randomly until you find something interesting. In this case, we stopped because we found a wolf. If we press that again, we'll continue on. Notice well that you also rest before you start moving. So, it basically combines the rest feature into the, into the odd move feature. And as such, you don't have to click a whole lot of buttons to play this game. It's very, very uh, easy to play this game. Now, uh, sometimes you'll find pieces of lore, and these basically add a bit of a flavor to tell you a little about, uh, bit about the nature of like the game and like what the sort of uh, scenario is that's sort of like uh, um, happening here. The world of Magiel is a uh, very diverse and flavorful world with lots of different factions, um, enemies, monsters and other fa uh, factors that just uh, make for a very beautiful place, and a very dangerous one as well. Sporadically moving snakes. And over here we actually found a dagger. So, I'll note that if you find daggers, you should automatically equip them with the uh, Shadow Blade character, just because they'll usually be a lot better than the ones you currently have. In this case, this one will do a little bit weaker base power, but it'll make up for it because it'll do a little bit of damage when I melee stuff. And when I get hit, I'll also uh, do a little bit of retaliation damage. Retaliation damage, how that works. Uh, you can press C, by the way, and it'll bring up your sort of character sheet. Um, if you go to your defense, basically when I get hit in um, melee, I'll basically do four temporal damage to whatever enemy hit me. Usually, retaliation damage doesn't factor in too much, but sometimes it can be a really big factor. Now, I'll note that um, how these dungeons are uh, made. They're actually separated into instances. We just cleared the first instance with Norgos Lair, and we're actually now at the uh, way to the next level of the instance. So, we're going to go off to the next level, and uh, I'll note that I have a transmogrification chest here. I'm not sure if you have to find this um, uh, initially anymore in the game, but in any case, the transmogrification chest is basically kind of like your your pet in, say, uh, Torchlight or um, other games that have like a basically an infinite source of uh, inventory for you to make use of. Uh, what the transmogrification, ch uh, transmogrification chest is is basically a way of instantly storing items for you to uh, use at the on the level. But once you reach the end of the level, you either have to take them out or you have to sell them to the transmogrification chest. Now, the transmogrification chest will basically take a discount when you sell stuff to it. So it's usually better to sell stuff in stores. However, it's worth knowing that later on in the game, it actually does have a, a big benefit to uh, sell stuff to the transmogrification ch trans chest. Though, I'll worry about that when we actually get there. For now, we're going to take out the Elm Magic Staff, and we're actually going to uh, sell that when we get to a store. As for the boots, we can actually wear those, so we'll put them on. Alright, um, we just found this guy, Turgos the Lost Warrior. This guy's an example of an escort quest. And basically what he wants to, um, to ha uh, us to do for him is to lead him to his uh, escort portal where he can um, basically escape. So you should always do this by the way, you should lead on and protect these guys. Now, something you can do is you can right click on this guy and say, where's the portal? And he'll basically tell you uh, where the portal is. In this case he says it's still far away to the northwest. So that's probably uh, very far away, but for now we're going to start trying to lead him there. I'll note that these guys, they, they'll automatically move towards the uh, destination that they need to go to. Um, I recommend that you always get in front of them, and then just basically lead them there. 
if possible. Sometimes you can't tell where they're going. They'll just basically take the, you know, the route they decide to take. But where possible is try and stay in front of them and basically deal with anything that pops up. Alright, so we just leveled up uh, and we're now level 2. When you level up, you get a full uh, refund on all your uh, life, stamina, or whatever resources you have available. And you'll also be able to get some generic points, class points, and stats to spend. Unless it's your fifth uh, level or your uh, very last maximum level. But we'll get to those when we get to the fifth level and maximum level. Alright, so we now have a bit more stats, class points, and a generic point to spend. We're going to keep investing in dexterity over here. And you'll notice that because I uh, invested up to 22 points here, we actually unlocked Dagger Mastery for a second investment. Um, talents basically have multiple levels that you can invest in them. It's between 1 and 5. On the 5th level, that's basically the maximum of the talent, and you can't really invest any more in that. Now, investing in talents usually has diminishing returns. As you can see, on the first talent uh, point here, we're basically getting 12 physical power from using daggers. But when we're using the daggers themselves, we only get an increase in damage of about 11%. So you get diminishing returns. However, it is definitely worth uh, investing in uh, dagger mastery to get more out of our daggers, because that'll be, that'll be our primary weapon for killing foes. Um, over in class points, we're just going to drop in our point dual strike, and uh, we'll just continue on for now. Now, I'll note by the way that um, if you're hurt and uh, you get an escort, it is possible to sort of wait um, and re rest up if you're sure this guy can't get by you. This guy can't move by me. He'll just basically wait for me uh, pleasantly until I move out of the way. If he can't move, he won't move. And uh, I'll just note that we actually suffer a debuff effect. So Poison Ivy has the ability to poison you. Um, poison is an example of a detrimental effect that will basically uh, hurt your character in some way. They appear to uh, the left of your positive um, be beneficial effects on the uh, right of your screen over here. In the case of Poison, it's just going to damage us a little bit per turn. So it's nothing really too worrisome. So let's ignore it and let's push on. But as you can see, we'll take damage over turn while it's on us. Uh, eventually, stuff like poison will be a little bit more detrimental, but early on in the game it's not too bad. Now, I'll note that I can't see this guy anymore, but I know he's going to keep following me, and there's nowhere else for him to go, so we're just going to keep pushing on. Now, I'll note by the way that you want to keep watching for uh, the levels of these guys. Sometimes you might find, say, a level 5 or uh, a really uh, difficult snake early on in the game when you're like starting out. And difficult enemies can be a little bit bothersome to fight. In the uh, in instance of, the, like, say, the snake being a much higher level, he might actually be strong enough to uh, really pose a, a threat to my character and kill me if I'm not careful. Alright, so we've reached the sort of room area here. At this point, I can't really be sure that this guy is going to be blocked off by my movement speed. Um, as you can see, he's still moving on toward the uh, uh, portal, wherever it is. Now, we just encounter a forest troll. He shouldn't be too tough. But anyways, um, if this guy sees an enemy and you're not in front of him, he'll actually start backing away. This enemy, though, is not too tough, so we won't really worry about him. Alright, so there's his portal. Once we kill this wolf, um, he should start moving back towards his portal. Assuming he doesn't see more enemies. And let's wait for him to get there, and he made it to his portal, and now we'll get a reward. So, when you get an um, a escort to his reward, you basically get uh, escort rewards for doing so. In the case of the Lost Warrior here, you will always get these benefits. You're allowed to train a category technique conditioning. You can train up Exotic Weapons Mastery, Vitality, Unflinked Resolve, 1 stat point in Constitution, or 2 in Strength. We're probably going to drop maybe a point in Vitality or Unflinched Resolve, I think, for the first uh, point. Uh, or, you know, what we choose here. Um, on Fleet Resolve, what it could do, it could basically let us shrug off detrimental effects. That can be very beneficial later on in the game, but um, I found that with, with recent updates of this game, it's actually gotten to the point where um, detrimental effects weren't as bad as they, as they usually are anymore. Vitality, however, is still a big threat. They've actually increased the um, uh, damage of poisons, disease, and wounds by quite a bit, so they're actually more of, con of a concern to your character later on. And additionally, the Vitality stat here, it'll actually also boost up our life when we uh, b go below 50% health. So we actually regenerate more. So we're just going to learn Vitality for now. And maybe later on we might uh, um, invest in Unflinched Resolve if we manage to find another Warrior Escort to escort out of uh, the dungeon. 
So at this point, we're just going to push on and merrily go on our way, killing everything that comes in our sight. Resting up as we go. Now, I'll note by the way that with resting, you basically get a free heal from it unless there's um, enemies moving around, possibly looking for you. If you have the option to rest, you should always do so. Unless you're really sure that there's like, you know, real no, really no point. Early on here, you can see I'm not really taking a whole lot of damage from these guys, so I'm not really concerned. Um, I'll note that we just ran into a, basically a special effect Uro Zone type thing here. This is an anti-magic bush, and it's basically an example of a, a terrain feature that you'll find in Magiel. The anti-magic bush basically uh, is providing a sort of uh, positive buff, so to speak, here. Though it also has a detriment to it as well. As you can see, it basically grants us 20% nature damage when we attack. But at the same time, we actually uh, also lose a little bit of uh, spell power on um, our character. I'm not actually casting spells, so that's not really a detrimental effect just yet. But later on, if I have uh, spells and want to make use of them, that could be very bad to stand in. You all want to be very careful what um, uh, terrain effects might do. In some cases, they might actually make it a little bit uh, more tactically interesting for your character in a battle. Or in our instance, it just could make it even easier for you. Alright, so we just cleared the second instance of Norbus' Lair. Now, I'll notice um, something of importance here. You don't actually have to uh, um, continue on in this current dungeon you're in when you're in it. If at any time you want to, you can actually leave uh, the instance to go elsewhere. And that's what we're going to do right now. The reason I'm leaving this instance is because um, of the fact that if I leave the instance, I can go elsewhere to level up a little bit. And um, then I can come back and fight the boss here, who's actually kind of tough at the moment just for a level 2 character. Alright, so we picked up a few items, as you can see. Um, I'm going to just uh, go through here. We're going to put on this lamp. And we don't have any gloves yet, so we'll actually put this on. We found this mana search ruin, but we probably won't use it over our current one. In general, mana search ruins aren't too useful for my character early on. They might be a little bit more useful later on, but early on they're not too bit big of an issue to really worry about. The rest of the stuff, we're just going to keep it, and we'll sell it in a shop, I think. Alright, so we're going to go over here, and you'll notice that this icon over here, it looks like the world map. And, well, it is the world map, more or less. This is the way to get out of the level. So at this point, we're now on the uh, open world map of Magiel. Um, right here is our uh, town chateau. There's the dungeon we were in, Norbus' lair. And down here, we have the uh, other dungeon that we talked about. For now, we're going to just enter uh, the town chateau here. And we're just going to go sell off these access items that we picked up. I'll note that um, there's basically different shops that you can shop in, in these uh, different uh, towns that you'll be able to look into. More or less, you, most of the time, you won't have to worry too much about shopping around. Um, you'll basically find whatever you need to in the game. But sometimes it'll be beneficial to look in these shops to see if there's something that might uh, help you out if you're lacking certain items or if other issues are present. Now, these gloves, I was considering possibly uh, using them, but because we found another pair, we'll actually not worry about them anymore. And we'll sell them. Alright, so I'll note that in the town of Chateur here, there's actually an infusion shop. You might want to check this at the start of the game to see if they have any useful infusions for you. The one you start out with is not that great. You'll actually want to replace it as soon as possible. Um, it doesn't look like we have the money to replace any of these, but it looks like we might be able to uh, potentially want to maybe grab this infusion right here. Or maybe even this one if you decide to invest in the constitution staff for some reason. Uh, these uh, ones right here, the reason that I'm looking at them is because uh, this one basically scales with the cunning stat. And the cunning stat is one I actually use on the Shadow Blade character. The one down here is one that scales with constitution. That's kind of important. Not exactly something I uh, will level up a whole lot in the Shadow Blade character, but it is of importance. The one down here is the one for a warrior. Uh, if I was more of a strength type character, that might be useful, but I'm definitely not going to be raising up strength. It does have the highest value, but it also has the highest cooldown. And those reasons really sort of shunt that out as being uh, one I'll use. I'll also note that you can look at other stuff down here, like the Wild Infusions, to see if they're useful too as well. These ones uh, in particular aren't, because they uh, cure magical effects or mental effects, and those won't be an issue for some time to come. The other shops in here include a heavy armor shop, 
um, a light armor shop. And you actually go up here and find uh, a bow shop and a mace shop and all that other stuff up here as well. There's a sound, the range shop, the sword shop, and the mace shop here. So we're going to go back to the world map. And at this point, if I want to, I can actually uh, go back to Norvis's lair to uh, continue on my quest. But for now, we're actually going to go um, out into the open world a little bit. Over here, you'll find um, the starting area for halflings and human type characters. Over here is their starting dungeon, the Trollmire, and that's where uh, halflings and human type characters will spawn. And their uh, second dungeon that they're told about is Corpool. Their hometown is Durf. And we might go into Durf but, uh, a little bit later, but for now, um, what we're going to do is we're just going to push on. Over here we'll see this guy, this is a novice mage. This guy is uh, from the faction Anguin. He's actually on a quest, and if you talk to him, he basically uh, tells you that he's not uh, really going to trouble you, but he's actually on a quest to get accepted by the people of um, Anguin. He basically tells you a little bit about it, but um, he's like, eh, maybe not. But he will tell you that I'm looking for an arcane infused artifact. Now, if you bring him an arcane infused artifact, he'll be very happy, and he'll, may, and he'll actually tell you a secret. But for now, we'll uh, wait for that and actually find the arcane um, artifact he wants first. Now, I'll note that we just picked up a quest. If you press J, you can bring up your journal to see what uh, quest that you have active. Now, as, as you can see, we actually had a quest for the uh, Lost Warrior over here, and we actually successfully completed it, and it says, done. So that's how you know that you can basically complete that quest successfully, and you're quite happy about it. And it also tells you reward as well. Over here, we've got the Apprentice class, and as you can see, we're basically tasked with collecting an arc, ar artifact with arcane, powered, uh, ar arcane powers, more or less, to it. And then, of course, we have our starting quest, which is just the Madness of the Ages, where we just have to explore our two starting dungeons. Now, this is the um, final starting area that you'll probably be able to access with any character. This is the uh, Shaloran Elf starting area, and there's their hometown of Elvia. They start in the Skintelin Caves, and they also have the Rolorn Camp over here. Now, notably, these are actually considered to be the harder um, starting dungeons for most characters. Now, I'm actually going to go into these uh, early because they're actually not that hard. They just require a little bit of thought and patience on how you should uh, approach them. So, the Skitzling Cave has basically got this very gem feeling to it, and you'll see why in a bit. Note, by the way, I'm making use of this minimap to sort of see if there's any red dots or any other type of dots appearing on my uh, screen over here. If I see a red dot, it means there's an enemy. Sometimes, because my mod is really uh, uh, you know, small, I can't see the guys that may spawn down here. So if I use this, I can see what's going on. We're just going to all explore for now. And here's the uh, example of an uh, um, enemy. And I'll note, by the way, just press L. If you press L, you can actually look around your screen to see if there's stuff around you. If you use your mouse, you can scroll around with it. Or additionally, if you press L and just use the shift keys and press the arrow keys, you can actually move it around manually. So this is a, a gem type of enemy here, the Crimson Crystal. Um, this guy, these crystal type enemies are what really make this uh, dungeon difficult for people. But we actually have an advantage over um, most other people because first you got me telling you how you can get through these guys. And second, um, we also have Rush. So Rush is this melee ability. And what it does is it basically teleports us up to an enemy. So we'll use Rush and we basically instantly teleport to him and hit him. Now, when we hit him, we'll actually do 120% damage, and we'll have a chance to daze him if we don't outright kill him, like I just did. Now, but you want to note something. This has a very long cooldown. If um, you rush into an open room or something like that, it can actually be very dangerous. So be careful who you're rushing and where you're rushing. In, in a general sense, don't rush into the black. We'll just press re um, rest to rest up a little bit. And you'll note that it sort of stopped there before the full cooldown was met. If your health restores completely before your cooldowns do, it'll actually stop. And this stuff will still be on cooldown, but your health and all that will be fully restored. Just press R again, you can just keep resting. Now, this uh, little scroll item over here... Oh, there's a crystal. We'll kill him first, so again, we'll rush him. This uh, scroll item here is actually um, a special type of lore. It only appears in this dungeon. And usually, uh, pieces, pieces, uh, scraps of lore that appear in certain dungeons will have this sort of scroll-like formation, unlike the other lore pieces you might find. If we step on it, it'll actually tell us a little bit about the lore of this specific dungeon, and it basically adds a little bit of flavor on what's going on in this uh, specific instance. Alright, so we're just going to all explore for now, and we'll just kill all stuff as we uh, find it. For the most part, nothing is really going to be too difficult other than those crystals. 
and I just heard a very uh, scary sound. So up here we've got this uh, white crystal. And I'll note by the way, uh, you didn't really see it because it goes away fast, but you can go press your message lock over here. Down here, this, um, basically there's this uh, white crystal and it just casts Ice Bolt on us. And I just used this little text down here to see hostile spot to the northwest, white crystal, to find out where he was without using my mini map. So this guy is firing Ice Bolt at it, and this is where I disguise these guys are dangerous. They basically cast um, these ranged spells at you that can do a lot of damage. In the case of this uh, Ice Bolt here, it's not too dangerous because it's very slow moving. So we can actually move up. And, oh, this guy actually phase doored. So phase door is like a defensive spell that these guys have. You actually um, have it too. But when they use it, it basically randomly teleports them around to somewhere. And you have to go find them again. Or they'll phase door right back in front, front of you as well, possibly. So this ice bolt that was fired, it's still traveling towards Sully. Um, it's going to hit this pr uh, tire, tire t uh, cell right there. Because we moved up, this is actually going to move here and move here. So it'll miss us for sure. And it'll just explode harmlessly where we won't really care about it. Now, I will note that in some cases you want to be very careful about some of these um, guys. The red crystal here in general, for example, is an example where his bolts travel really fast. It's likely that you won't have any time to react if they fire at you. They're just going to hit you with whatever bolts they fire. So, if I kill this guy, he'll probably fire at me, maybe. And yeah, he fired at me, and it's very instant. Um, he didn't fire because that guy was in the way, but once I kill him, he basically fired and this guy moved in the way again. So, this guy fired his attack at me, and did a little bit of burning damage and fire damage. So here's another detrimental effect It's burning. It's not too bad. He didn't too do too much damage, so we can just easily just get through this guy. Now, he casts Phase Door as well, but this is the thing to know about Phase Door. It's no guarantee that you'll be able to get out of range of uh, whatever you're uh, doing with it. So he actually has Phase Door about two tiles, so he's just easily enough to rush and kill. And let's push on. Alright, so you'll note that you'll stop whenever you take damage as well as see a monster. In this case, we uh, took some damage from this guy. He fired uh, another little flame spell at us, or flame bolt, whatever it is he's firing. Let's see. Check the message log here. It actually tells you what they fire. So this guy fires a flame bolt at you, and he sets us on fire. He does a little bit of damage with it, and then he also has the burning damage afterwards. So I'll note, by the way, uh, the, the range of rush at level 1 is kind of limited. As you level it up, you'll actually increase the range as well as lower the cooldown. But we only left it at 1 because we don't really need it too high just initially. And that guy actually moved out of the way, but oh well. We'll actually use a regeneration rune here and we'll just uh, press R to heal up. Now, you'll notice that there's a fire bolt that is fired there. This guy is probably down in this direction now. And there he is. And you'll actually note that this time we actually see his flame bolt. Sometimes, uh, even though this guy fires a very fast bolt, you will catch sight of it. And you can actually avoid it. So if we step this way, you can actually avoid this shot. But I'll note, by the way, that... This flame bolt, and because he's close, if I uh, rush him, I'll actually appear right here, which is actually ahead of this. And if I do that, this will actually still harmlessly attack up there and miss me. Now, he actually had another buddy here, which is actually where we get into the feature that rush can be kind of dangerous. I sort of went into the black here, and there's another guy present, and he could attack me. But luckily he didn't, so we can just uh, use dual strike to kill him and just be on our way. When you're dealing with these crystals, the best thing to do is just to kill them as fast as possible before they have a chance of uh, reacting to you. Um, if there's something like this really far away, another thing you can do is just stay off last sight, and maybe uh, look at um, uh, other options you have to get closer to them. Now I'll note that I leveled up again, so we can just uh, go into our uh, stat screen by pressing P, and we'll spend a few more stat points to uh, level up our character a little bit. Um, I think at this point, at 22 dexterity, we're doing pretty fine with uh, uh, talent point investment. So we're going to invest a few points into magic. And you'll notice that uh, I opened up this spell down here and a second uh, point investment for phase door. We're going to invest our second point in phase door right now. And for this other class point, we're just going to throw it into dual strike again. So much as I said, the missing returns are in effect, and each point I'm adding here only adds a little bit of damage. But I'll note that Dual Strike, the reason I'm leveling it up so high, so, uh, so, so quickly initially, is because it's a very powerful effect, because it has this, um, well, let's see, let's see over here a little bit. Um, Alright, I'll know it's kind of hard to sort of use the mouse to sort of show you what's going on. But you can basically see the sort of skill, skill description over here. 
This attack in particular, when you're leveling it, it actually increases the target's stun duration. Stun is a very powerful debuff that you can apply to enemies, but also when it, um, some enemies can also apply to you. When an enemy is stunned, or if you are stunned, uh, what the effect will do, it will actually reduce the target's uh, damage output by quite a bit, and it will also cut their movement speed. So it's a very powerful debuff to sort of lock down an opponent. And then if you lock them down, you can just wail on them right after. I'll note, by the way, that we also have Dirty Fighting over here, and it more or less does the same thing. But its damage is a little bit less, and early on, it's not that great to level up this real quickly. So we'll accept those changes, and we'll just push on for now. We'll, uh, I'll note, by the way, if you are uh, got like a detrimental effect and you want to rest or explore, it will actually stop you each turn that you uh, have this effect on. So it'll just be like an instant rest until it's gone. Once it goes, though, you can all explore rest and just be on your way. Alright, this guy's over here. We're just going to rush him. It looks like there's another crystal somewhere in the area, but oh well. There's the downstairs to the next level of this, uh, of this um, instance. Now, I'll note, by the way, that uh, if you're approaching an enemy, sometimes the best thing to do when there's like, you know, these enemies that don't have any sort of ranged ability, just wait for them to get closer to you. If you step closer to them, they actually get a free attack on you when you enter their melee range. If you wait for them, and they come into a tile range of you, you actually get the free attack on them. In some cases, this isn't always true, and you'll see why um, as you play this game. Some effects, like for the Berserker, they have uh, a skill called Fearless Cleave, that will basically let them uh, open up the assault by moving and attacking at the same time. Other uh, um, guys, like say this guy, if like this guy was uh, able to move at me, he could have a ranged spell like this, and he could just fire that instead of moving towards me, which should sort of uh, waste a turn for me. Alright, so this guy's fired a Flame Bolt. In this case, we're going to move down this direction to avoid it. And as you can see, this goes whoop, like that. And um, I'll note that we need to move at least three uh, squares towards this guy to get close enough to hit him. So we're just going to do that, too. And you'll notice they fired another Flame Bolt. Luckily for us, he missed us. So we can just rush him at this point and avoid it and kill him. Um, I'll also note, by the way, that we've picked up a Red Crystal Shard. I probably picked up a few of these. And I may have picked up some other greens as well. What those represent are basically uh, um, features of the monster that you just basically cut off or collected from them. Uh, they, they serve some importance, but we'll get to those a little bit later on in the game. Oh. Alright, so here's an example of where we ran into an enemy that might be dangerous. In this case, we ran into a rogue. These guys are stealthed enemies, and when they're in stealth, they basically do a whole lot of damage to you if you don't detect them. In this case, we got lucky. We actually detected this guy, uh, and now we can basically open assault on him. We're going to hit him with dual strike. And that actually did a lot of damage. And as you can see, he's, he survived it, so he's actually um, able to feature the stun debuff that we uh, were talking about. Because I put the stun on him, he's actually got a lot of reduced damage. And if he was going to try and move, move away, he wouldn't have a very good, good luck at it, because I'd be able to catch up very easily with him. So we'll kill him. And, oh, we found another dangerous enemy. This is the Skeleton Mage. This guy you should really watch out for. He has the ability to cast spells. And he's a good example of, what, of a dangerous enemy that you can face right away. Um, I'm actually going to position myself by going to this tile, and the reason for doing this, this guy doesn't have any beam spells early on, and if I do this, he will actually move towards you to try and get him ranged with you, and uh, he won't cast any spells. So, I'm actually going to let him just sort of sit there for a the moment, and I'm just going to wait another turn. Now, I'm not sure if uh, the white ant attacked me or if this guy moved first, but if this guy was moving first, he'd actually move uh, first and then you know, keep moving in my direction. If um, this guy was dead, he might have just cast a spell on me. But in any case, he's now two tiles away. We're going to approach one square, and there's an example of him casting a spell. He casts Mana Frost. And as you can see, he can do a lot of damage if you're not careful. This is a good example of a guy that can really kick your ass, so be very careful when you're around him. Um, you also notice I got this like sort of white thing around me. In this case, my Vitality kicked in. As you can see, we've got the Temporary Status Effect down there, uh, Recovery. That's basically making us regenerate HP due to our Vitality uh, talent that we picked up from that Warrior Escort. You also notice they have the Sustain count, uh, Shadow Comet there, which uh, is basically uh, talking about this one right here. And as you can see, there's the recovery being uh, stewed right there, and it tells us the target is recovering 15 life each turn. Alright, so this guy did a whole lot of damage to us, and it really, really hurt. Um, the best thing I can probably do right now is just try and avoid further damage. Now, I'm going to use the Wrath of the Woods, and the reason for using this is it's actually going to reduce the damage that this guy can do. It will also increase my damage output, but not by a whole lot, especially uh, early on in the game. Now, this guy can probably cast other spells, but one of the spells he can cast is, is the Flame Spell that causes the raining effect on us. 
So we're actually going to let him possibly cast a spell first, and then we'll use our wild infusion to sort of uh, show how he can remove a detrimental effect. Alright, so he didn't actually get a chance to cast a spell, we actually stunned him. If uh, you stun a character, it's worth knowing that sometimes you can put it on their uh, talents that they have available on cooldown. So I bet what we did here, we actually put it on his uh, flame spell on cooldown, and he couldn't cast it on. So pieces we had to resort to uh, melee attack. So let's finish this guy off, and another guy appeared. So in this case, I, I'm not probably in a good position to fight this guy. Most of my stuff is on cooldown, and my health is a little bit low as well as my stamina. What we're going to do with this guy here, we're actually going to move diagonally to get out of range of him. And then we're just going to um, activate our regeneration rune here. And as you can see, he's actually firing us. He, he saw us there, but uh, he couldn't do anything about us. We're going to move um, nowhere for the moment. We're just going to wait a few turns while we wait for stuff to co um, come off cooldown. So I'm just manually pressing 5 here, and this basically makes us wait one turn while stuff happens. And this guy apparently just uh, phased door right over here now. So at this point, I pretty much have to deal with this guy. Um, I could try running away, maybe around his corner, but he's likely going to get shot. So it'll just be, it's just, in this case, it's just easy to run toward him at this point. I'm going to move diagonally up to here, and then we'll move diagonally back down. And I'm going to sort of uh, diagonal pattern because it actually makes this guy a little bit harder to possibly hit us with um, uh, ranged uh, attack spells, Norm notably when he actually fires them. Um, well, I suppose that's not really true. I just did that for uh, showman's sake, I guess. So that guy's dead, and we're just going to rest up normally by pressing R and just moving on. Alright, so in our red crystal up here, we'll move up. And he phased door yet again. There he is yet again. We'll rush him. Alright, there's still a white crystal somewhere. Oh, there he is. So it said he's to the southwest, and there he is right now. So this guy, as I said, this guy's got the slow ice bolt attack. So let's approach him slowly. And then we'll just rush him. Now note that enemies don't necessarily attack you every turn. Uh, sometimes they'll be guaranteed, guaranteed to attack you, but other times, don't worry about them too much. They're not too much of a threat. So this guy actually dropped something very precious. He actually dropped uh, an amulet. Amulets um, are usually fairly powerful sometimes. In this case, this one has uh, pinning and knockback immunity. And um, pitting and knockback, they're not necessarily too important early on, but eventually uh, they'll be possibly uh, important to have. Now, this other stuff more or less isn't too important to us, but um, it's probably a good time to start moving this to normal inventory. So we'll do that for now, and when we get to a town, we'll sell it. Now, I'll note by the way, if you press the I key, it'll actually bring up your inventory. So if you ever want to um, bring up your um, inventory, just press the I key. Also, there's also different tabs that show off the different stuff. And over here is basically an all tab that basically shows everything in your inventory. Alright, so this is the downstairs to the next level. We're going to push on. And I think this will be the last instance that we'll do for this initial episode. This to sort of get into the actual game. Alright, so we got a black crystal down here. Um, as you, uh, just so you know, someone uh, commented that they couldn't understand why this guy had resi reverse uh, resistances. This black crystal, what he does is he absorbs all the light around it. So if you're ever wondering why this guy's black, a black crystal, yet he resists light resistance, is because he's absorbing all the uh, um, light around him. I guess I'm resisting him so, uh, from it. All right, so in this case, we're uh, able to make t use of a tactical ability to sort of avoid this guy. We're not yet close enough to him with rush. But if we move in this direction, we'll actually move out of uh, his sight range. So, so how sight range works in this game? If uh, there's like you know like a uh, you know wall in the way of your target, you can't see through it. But um, if there's like a corner here, you can see him just around the corner. So in this case, we'll just uh, approach a little bit, and we actually got this guy sort of getting close. But we'll uh, let's kill him first. Now this guy actually phased door, and uh, he's now a little bit over here. That's fine. He also used his Blight Bolt, which is his ability. But we'll just uh, rush him and deal with him. And let's press on. You'll notice over there to the left is in our lore piece. We'll uh, pick this up. There's uh, the third part of the research journal. And he's basically telling you a little bit about a new element that he found is here. And he's wondering uh, what to call it and how it works and all that.
All right, we're going to move down. Now, I'll note that this guy basically uh, shot me with something called Blood Grasp. I'll note that um, some of these uh, abilities that enemies can have, they can have special abilities attached to them. In the case of this Crimson Crystal, and I'm just going to right-click on this guy and go inspect the creature and click on his talents. He has something called Blood Grasp. And if you look down here, you'll see it projects a bolt of corrupted blood doing blight damage. And, any, and half of that damage that he deals will actually be uh, used to heal himself. So this guy should have the ability to heal himself when he hits me. Luckily he's at full health, so it doesn't really matter too much, but it could be detrimental on an uh, enemy that had higher HP. Now I'll note this uh, mouse over here, he has sort of disappeared. This is an example of a guy that can use stealth talents. In this case, you use hide in plain sight and actually, actually put him in stealth, even though I was uh, able to see him do it. And I'll note that he was right there, but um, because I sort of knew he was right there and I moved into his tile, I instantly killed him. If you know, if you, uh, if you're unable to move into a tile because there's an enemy that's stealth there, you'll actually still try to attack it, though you'll have a, a disadvantage in trying to attack them because their stealth value actually gives them a very big defensive ability. Alright, uh, in this case, I'll note that this guy is a little bit far off. But, I'm not too worried about him. Alright, so we've actually come to a crystal I'm kind of happy to have found. This is the blue crystal, it's a little bit different than the ones we've find, been finding so far. He's actually an example of one of the few crystals in here that doesn't actually have a bolt attack. But he's actually very dangerous to uh, possibly fight in melee. When you get close to him, he'll uh, apparently phase her out of the way. Let's try and go find him. We'll actually use our mouse click to try and find this guy. Where did you go? Alright, so here he is again. If you get close to these guys, they might do a special ability. Come on, use it. I'm waiting. Just die. Alright, so those guys actually have a close range spell, if they actually use it. That guy didn't, so he just died for it. Uh, note, by the way, that this guy just got hit by something. It's worth knowing that in some cases, you might find that um, enemies are doing friendly fire to each other. This guy doesn't have any cold resistance, and that guy actually fired a shot. And this guy actually moved in the way of that shot and got hit by it. So down here are those enemies that fired it. So here's the guy that fired an ice bolt and all that. And he's firing yet another one. So one of the reasons that these guys aren't firing their bolts because there's guys in the way is because they'll actually hit their friends and not me. And we got another red crystal, or the same one. We'll get close and then we'll rush them. Alright, so at this point we've cleared out through the uh, second instance of the Skintilin Caves. We're actually going to continue back on to uh, the world map yet again. And I'll note that we picked up a few more things. Um, one of the things that we picked up was this uh, Strength Pair of Gauntlets. But I see where we picked up one that actually has a Strength Modifier to it. These uh, plus uh, two Strength Modifiers are on these Gauntlets. I'll note that they actually um, can be very useful to your character. And I'm just going to put this into uh, this over here. This is another strength modifying arm, but I'm actually picking up this pickaxe more for the dig factor that it has. And you'll see that in a little bit when I just demonstrate it. Alright, we're going to keep all this stuff. But I don't see anything we want to actually wear right now. Now, I'll note that our Nkumas just went over uh, 67. When your Nkumas goes over your maximum, you actually can't move. So, we're actually going to go to the next level. If I try and move around, you'll see it says, unable to move! So, when this happens, you have to actually sell or transmogrify some of your items so you can move again. Uh, you'll note that the increments values are over here, so in this case we have to get rid of 3 or 4 weight in order to move again. Uh, what took off all our uh, space, so to speak, was this spiked iron mail right here. So we're actually going to sell it, because it's uh, so heavy. Now, I'll notice that you, we actually picked up that pickaxe and equipped it. Pickaxes uh, are digger implements, and how they uh, sort of work. They basically give you the talent dig. 
and I have my talent dig on my favorite hockey over here. The talent dig is something that lets you dig a, uh, dig a wall or cut a tree where it is diggable. Um, these things are uh, diggable, for example, so we'll use this on them. And you can actually use the digging uh, tool to actually dig through walls if you want. This can be useful for tactical reasons, but it can also be useful if, uh, for example, a part of the level didn't actually spawn that is actually reachable to you unless you actually dig to it. So in this case, we actually cut through this wall. If there's an enemy over here, I could make use of this uh, digging implement to actually cut through them, cut through the wall to them. Now, I'll note by the way, if you press the Z to all explore, and there's nothing to all explore, if there's an exit that I can take you to, it'll actually take you straight to that exit. So that's what it did here. All right, so we just completed the uh, second instance of Skinsling Caves there. We're going to go into the town of Chateur, or Elvia right here. This is the capital of the Shaloran Elves. Um, I'll note that if you go into um, this area, there's actually a special uh, building over here called the Shaded Library. This can actually give you um, a whole lot of lore uh, pertaining to the Spellblaze Chronicles, which actually details a very horrific event that happened in the world of Magiel. There's also a sword shop if you're interested in swords for your characters. There's a rune shop, which might be of interest to us if there's a good rune in here, which there's not. And there's also this guy called Home with the Maris of the Alchemist. So when I was talking a little bit about ingredients, this is what it really pertains to. These uh, guys called Alchemists are actually on a quest. So, you get approached by this guy, and he's uh, looking for an adventure, and he's actually trying to make some elixirs before other uh, guys trying to get into the Brotherhood of Alchemists do the same. Basically, there's a competition that the Brotherhood of Alchemists is doing to try and uh, um, cut through the fodder in order to find the best alchemist for its group. And this guy wants us to bring ingredients to make his elixirs for, for us to do so. So, this guy's trying to get in for, um, for the other alchemists, and I'll note that there's a total of four of these guys that you can actually help. You don't actually have to choose to help Maris. You can actually choose to help the other alchemists if you so wish. But since we're here, we'll see what this guy wants. So this guy will want us to help him in making the Elixir of Mysticism, the Elixir of the Savior, and the Elixir of the Mastery. Right now for us, we probably want to maybe invest in either the Elixir of Mysticism or the Elixir of Mastery. The Elixir of Mysticism will increase our magic and our willpower stats by free. We're not really using willpower too much, but it does have a lot of benefits because willpower is considered to be one of the most powerful stats in this game. And magic will be more beneficial to us later on when we're actually trying to uh, increase our magic stat for um, spell power or just to get access to skills. So we'll choose the Elixir of Mysticism and we'll be off. I'll note by the way there's also a tailor over here if you want to. And we'll actually sell our stuff into here just because uh, I don't plan to use this shop at all. I'll note that the starting shops, as I said, they aren't really too important. You can use them and sometimes you might see me just do so, but they'll be a very rare event. We're just going to sell everything in here. I'll note by the way you actually picked up some gems. Gems are very high, um, high valued uh, items that you can find and they don't really weigh anything. If you're looking for some early money that's a great way to get getting some just by selling a few gems. Gems do have some importance for certain classes like alchemists or for uh, special talents but we haven't really got those so we don't really worry about them. I'll note that there's also a staff shop over here, and this is the only staff shop I think that's available um, in the world map Arden in Anglin, the city of mages. Alright, so at this point we've gone through two instances of the Skinsling Caves and two instances of the uh, Norgos' Lair, our starting dungeon. Next time we're actually going to go explore the Trollmire over here a couple more instances, and then we'll go revisit Norgos' Lair and Skinsling Caves for um, the bosses of those instances. Take care for now.